All right. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's Brother Smith, Pastor Smith, First Gospel Church, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Let's see. How do we get our... I guess it's all right. Anyway, it's Thursday night at 7 p.m. and uh, the 13th of May, 2021. So, I want to welcome everyone tonight and tell you how much I appreciate you uh, sharing this time with us. Most everyone knows that I'm, I have been working for quite some time now on the, um, on the book of Revelations and the end time for, uh, <clears throat> the end of the gen, uh, Gentile world. And I've been asking, answering some questions um, to the people in the Dominican Republic and in Mexico um, and people that work under Brother Hugo Rodriguez and one of the questions that we had um, Monday night was this question here in fact it's two questions and I think they pretty much relate to each other one is when will the marriage of the lamb take place and who will be there will it only be the ones who made the bride in the latter reign restored church and then the other question is what will be the work of the bride during the millennium so, big questions. Um, I started out in um, the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations <clears throat> to answer these questions. And so, um, if it's okay, that's where we'll go. It's the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations. I'm, I will, while I'm waiting a little while for more people to get on, I might just mention that I have uh, I found a way to have a private Zoom meeting where I'll be the only one on it and then record it. But in that meeting, I can uh, share my screen off of my computer, which I have it set up where half of the computer is me. Um, Actually, on the recording, the way it'll show up is my the whole screen of my computer will show up, which would be my Bible online. And then there will be a small rectangular screen of me. You can see me very plain and hear me. And uh, I'm starting to uh, explain the book of Revelations and record that chapter at a time in chronological order. I've went all over it during these Bible studies, but it's in, it's uh, inspired me. In fact, I've wanted to, to write a book for a long time of my position on the uh, uh, book of Revelations. But uh, every time I would get ready to write, and I wrote a lot on it, but every time I'd get ready to do that, I would feel checked. And uh, the more I would study it, the more I would write, the more adjustments I would see needed to be made. And God began to open my mind and my eyes to new understandings of certain scriptures. And uh, so I could now see why the Lord wanted me to hold off on, on writing anything about it. But uh, I feel... Uh, comfortable about going ahead and, and uh, giving my current position on the book of Revelations. I don't believe that I'm in any way have it 
uh, completely understood down to the, you know, letter or jot and tittle, so to speak. But I do believe that I understand it well enough that I can give you my position on it. And then uh, I don't want anyone to think that I think that I, my position is the only position on it. I, I think it's just, I'm wanting to give it out in the latter part of my ministry to as a platform that uh, people can take that platform and at least get a understanding of the book. And even though I I don't think that it's absolutely complete. I do believe God has revealed a lot to me on the book that I just want to share and give to God's people. And again, it's at least a platform that those who are interested, those that want to study it, you've got to learn something before you can figure out if it needs to be adjusted or figure out if, you know, is, is there something somewhere that uh, needs a better understanding to. You first have got to get a certain knowledge and I'm not only wanting to just give you the knowledge of the book, but I'm wanting to give you a good layout and a reasonable understanding of what the book is saying and what the Lord is saying to the Apostle John uh, to give to the churches. And so uh, we'll, we'll, you know, I want to, I want to do that. And, but but to be able to put it in recordings where it's a video, audio, and picture page where you can actually see the scriptures as they're being explained, I think is a, a real good tool. So we're going to be doing that. Um, I've already started it, and I'll be giving it out in the near future. So <clears throat> anyway... Um, that's where we're at. I see Brother and Sister Durham, Sister Layton, Brother Fidel, Brother, let's see, Sister McGowan, Sister Donna Hyatt, uh, Henderson Hyatt. I can't see everybody that's on. I don't know how many people are. It looks like 22, but I don't see all their names. It shows 22 up here anyway, so maybe 24 now. So I don't know where, I don't know how I can... Um, let me see here, just a second. <laughs> I don't know how all that works. Anyway, uh, maybe somebody can help me with that a little bit later. But, uh, so, <clears throat> for right now, um, Let's turn to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations. Again, I'll restate the questions that I have. Um, that is, uh, when will the marriage of the Lamb take place? And who will be there? Only those who made the bride in the latter rain restored church? Or who? And then in Revelations 20, the question was asked, what will the work be done? What will the work of the bride be during the millennium? So those kind of go together. We'll start here in the seventh and the nineteenth chapter of the book of Revelations, and uh, I hope you can follow me. Uh, I don't think I don't think that I'm capable. I know that they do have screen share. Let me just see here, right quick. Oh, I don't see where I can screen share what I'm doing. No. I just don't see where you can. I know it is possible, but I'll wait just a minute. Sorry for the delay here, but I'm just looking to see if I could screen share my my Bible with you. Right, 
I don't think uh, I can do that. So anyway, here we are. Um, and I'm going to take this back so I can see the Bible. <laughs> All right, chapter 19, book of Revelations, first chapter. It says, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true righteous, true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Oh, uh, I, I, uh, I probably ought to back up, if you wouldn't mind backing up with me, uh, in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, the God gets his people. I know that all of you people have heard the message, come out of her, my people. And that has not taken place yet. That won't take place until the last prophetical hour. And um, God then, after he gets all of his people out of Babylon, who will heed the call to come out? Not everyone will. In fact, I would venture to say it'll be a remnant that will come out of that. I know they're God's people, but they are going to join up with the beast and worship the image of the beast. And God, uh, he will give them time and he will deal with them with, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> he will deal with them during the la that last prophetical hour with judgment um, uh, he will, he will be, he will, his judgment will be greater, a stronger judgment to get their attention. Not only will the judgment itself, as far as the fierceness of it will be greater, but God's showing himself in, in demonstration and power of the spirit, healings and miracles in the new Testament, <clears throat> In that early church, in uh, that working of the Lord, and we'll call that the, the day of the Lord, which is uh, also the coming of the Lord and the end of the Jewish world. It's what everyone has to understand, that they're the day of the Lord or the coming of the Lord and the end of the Jewish world was to harvest that world. And then God, after he finished that world, it was a harvest. If you remember, Jesus told his, his disciples, said, pray for laborers, for the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray, pray for laborers. Well, we need to do that down here. Uh, the um, So <clears throat> God will first, uh, there will be a great, great manifestation of God in the restored church. A lot of people don't see much need for the church to be restored, but there is a great need for us to have everything the early church had. We will have to have a restored church. And um, we'll need an apostolic order. The seven spirits of God will which is the seven golden candlesticks. That is a perfect light. That's a clear understanding that God will manifest himself in a way that we won't be having uh, men trying to uh, locate the truth that was in that early church of the word of God, but we will know it. Uh, the third chapter of Amos said, God doeth nothing. Surely God does nothing but what he shows it first to his prophets. God will not make any uh, drastic changes until he begins to reveal that to his ministry. And so 
it's like I've read in the first chapter of, uh, I mean, in the first letter of Paul's writing to the church of Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, and the fifth verse where he said of the seat times and seasons, you have no need that I talk to you. Uh, he said, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And when they say, peace, peace, perfect, uh, sudden destruction will come upon them. Uh, he goes on and says that you, brethren, talking to the church there, the Thessalonians, he said, that day will not overtake you as a thief, for you're not children of the night, but you're children of the day. Well, that applies to you and I. Uh, God, that God is called into the body of Christ and revealed his uh, purpose and plan to us and gave us a vision of, of his plan and his purpose and uh, therefore, we're not children of the night. We're children of the day. And uh, we're not going to be in darkness that he would uh, uh, come as a thief in the night to us. We're, he, he's gonna, it's going to be a, a light to us. We'll have complete understanding of what he's doing. Just like this question is, when is the bride going to be made up? Well, we're, we're learning all the time. Uh, I'm trying to give you all the time exactly what the book of Revelation, it was written for. Uh, the end of the Gentile world, for, the, for us in the end of the Gentile world to understand. It's too difficult to understand before that because... Uh, they, we didn't even have as Gentiles knowledge, uh, good knowledge of the word of God and an understanding of what the early church had. Um, and, and that's why it's been necessary for a restoration. So <clears throat> here, if we back up to in the 15th, uh, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, we're just going to back up a few scriptures because I'm just going to show you that after God gathers his people that will heed the call to come out of Babylon, they will, those people will, uh, those that come out will come out and be a part of the bride of Christ. But when God finally sees that no one else is going to come out, then he's going to judge that system. And if we start in the 21st verse of the 18th chapter, it says, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus, with silence, shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and be found no more at all. See, God's going to judge her. Uh, and the voice of harpers. Now, here's where God shows I'm going to take everything that is of my spirit out of that system of Babylon. Right now, God has, he's still working among all of his people because he loves them and he wants to save them. And he does not, they're not going to be judged, even though they're in a system that's going to be judged. We'll show later how that the beast and the false prophet are going to be cast into the lake of fire which is second death. And so it says, uh, thus with violence shall the great city be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more all in thee. These are, this is pretty much all symbolic, uh, you know, the harpers, musicians, that's those that are able to harmonize the, he, he says here, uh, the, and sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Um, that's the Old Testament and the New Testament, to be able to harmonize that. It's, it's one song or one book. It's one message. Uh, trumpeters, trumpeters are, are, uh, sound an alarm. Uh, and then uh, uh, no craftsman. 
no builder, no one that can build in the kingdom of God, no matter what craft he is, no matter what gift of the ministry he has, shall be found no more at all in thee. The sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. Remember Jesus told his disciples, uh, he said, uh, uh, how did he say that? About a millstone be, oh, it, it, it would be better for you if a millstone is hung around your neck and you cast into the sea than it would for you to hurt one of these little ones. In other words, a millstone is a, you know, back in those days, they had just a, a big bowl. Mostly, most of those bowls were hewn out of stone and had a rock and they put wheat in there or barley in there and they ground it to flour with a millstone. And uh, that's a picture of the church grinding at the word of God. Uh, two women, Jesus said, would be grinding at the mill. One would be taken and the other would be left. Well, the woman that is uh, the strange woman or the false woman, the harlot that this Bible talks about, God's going to judge. That's what I'm talking about right now. He's going to judge that and she'll be taken out of the way. She'll be judged. Uh, so the sound of the millstone won't be heard no more at all in thee. That woman's grinding at the mill, but that woman's going to cease from that. God is going to judge that system and it won't any longer cease. I mean, it will no longer exist. It will cease. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. That, that's not talking about a seven-fold candelabra or a candle light. That's, uh, uh, that's, not, that's not talking about uh, the candle that's in the, the, the holy place because they don't have a seven-fold light. We're still striving for a seven-fold light ourselves in the holy place in a restored church but they do have a light. They're, they're, God's always, the Lord always gives a light. You know, even in the wilderness, the children of God, they had fire by night. Uh, God gave them light to see, even in nighttime. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in the wilderness. We've got, we have a light, but we have more. I believe we are getting, uh, flickers of that candlestick. I think our mediator, Jesus Christ, the head of the body, I believe that he is uh, giving us light from that candlestick. He has all, I believe Jesus has all seven spirits of God, and I believe he can uh, give us light in any one of those categories. Uh, but it's going to be removed from her and then, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. This is terrible. God's people in Babylon are going, if they don't heed God and come out of that system, they will be lost. They will be eternally judged unworthy. Uh, they are, uh, it's mentioned, I've, I've talked on it recently, on the vials that are going to be poured out, God is going to dry up the river Euphrates. That's Babylon. Um, and for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. Well, uh, God... Uh, and of all that were slain upon the earth. That's that's one of the reasons God's going to judge it because they destroyed many of God's people, prophets and saints. Uh, if you remember, uh, now now let me read the, fir the first bit, first two chap verses of chapter 19. They'll make more sense to you. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged 
the great whore. I know that's a hard word, but it's in the Bible. We need to use it from time to time to get the depth of understanding what he's talking about. Uh, that's someone that commits fornication with others, not, you know, we are to be virgins in, in type, symbolically, that is unto the Lord. He is to be our Savior. We're not to be uh, carried about with every wind of doctrine. And some woman opening up uh, uh, for just anything to be in, have a relationship with her that's not really righteous. Uh, and, and the Lord is not going to accept that. His bride is one. She's the only one of her mother, the Bible tells us. And so, in fact, when he was here on the earth, he wasn't, he never married because there was no one uh, that could be equally yoked with him. There was no one that could be his helpmate because there was no one that could work with him as his helpmate in what he was doing. That's why it's used as a type of the bride that's finally made herself ready to be a helpmate to Jesus and help him finish the work of righteousness and rule and reign with him for a thousand years to clean up the whole world. All right, he, he, he judged her, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged her the blood of his servants at her hand. Now, I want to say something about that right there. If, if uh, I'm going to go back for you to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations, and in the seals, uh, the fifth seal that's poured out there, uh, which, by the way, these seals, uh, you know, it's been taught in the past that these souls under the altar, which are in the fifth seal, are overcomers from the early church. I don't agree with that at all. I think we missed that. And uh, I want to give you my position on that because these seals are put out in chronological order. The white horse was the early, test the early New Testament church. It was righteous. That's why it was white red horse. See, when the church began to fall away, it turned red, the color of sin. That was a Pentecostal type era. People still, still had the Holy Ghost, but sin entered into the church. See, this happened chronologically. It happened in order, one right after the other. Then after this, after a time uh, of entering into the dark ages of the Gentile world, the, the church became a black horse. Black's the color of darkness or ignorance, lack of knowledge, night, not being able to see, not having a vision. And that was the color of the, and the rider of each horse was a different rider. Uh, you know, so of each one of these systems, the black horse is a type of the Protestant movement. Um, but now this is the church falling away. This is not us coming back into order this is the church falling away. So the church went went back there in the early church from a white horse after AD 70 to a red horse, from a red horse to a black horse. It was about 100 years after AD 70, I'm going to say up until 178, there was a black horse. I'm, I'm sorry, a red horse, Pentecostal type era. But then there were 360 years of a black horse. You add those together, that is 538. And that's when uh, Catholicism, the pale horse, came into existence. Death was the rider of it. See, this happened chronologically. So the, when you come to the fifth seal, you can't take it back to the early church and say this is people in the early church that made the bride. No, uh, but I want to show you how it fits into what we're talking about in the 19th chapter. Uh, in verse 9, it says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. 
And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also uh, and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Uh, the uh, here here th they're crying out th these these under the altar. This is not the golden altar. There's not anybody sacrificing anything under the golden altar. This is under the brazen altar in the outer court of the temple. That's the type. Um, that, and so uh, they were crying out, just like the blood of, of Abel cried out to God in the garden when after Cain slew him. And it's just showing that God was made aware. God was showing them, I am aware of your situation. But what, what it leaves a judgment. When is this judgment going to take place? How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, does it not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay, this happened after the pale horse, after Catholicism. Catholicism killed 50 million, martyred 50 million people. Uh, many are, are truly God's people, but they were martyred because they wouldn't accept some of the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and they were called heretics, and because they wouldn't recant, they wouldn't call the cracker the, the body, literal body. When you ate it, it had to literally become the dead body of Jesus Christ, and the, the, the wine had to literally become his blood. If they wouldn't, couldn't see that and they wouldn't recant that they didn't believe that, they would martyr them. They would burn them at a stake. These, th this fits perfectly within order of how everything took place, but white robes were given to every one of them. It was given to them. They were counted righteous. They were counted worthy. White robes represent righteousness. Jesus, just like the fourth chapter of the book of Romans tells us that because of Abraham's faith, he was counted worthy. Sin was not imputed. Blessed is the man whom God doth not impute sin, the psalmist said. And we are counted worthy. God doesn't impute sin because of the work that Jesus did on the cross God accepts his sacrifice for you and I and counts us worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, him laying down his life for you and I, and uh, until he can get us established and get us in a truly righteous place where he don't have to count us righteous, we will be righteous when he finishes his work in us, just like Jesus. He was made perfect by the things he suffered. <clears throat> uh, so, but here are these people, the question is, how long? When are you gonna when are you gonna avenge our blood? When is vengeance gonna be taken on this ungodly, unrighteous act that's taking place? Well, it's explained. Go back now with me to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. He explains there, uh, whoops, let me hit the wrong button. Let me go with you back to the 19th chapter. He explains here uh, in verse two, for true and righteous are his judgments. This judgment that he judges the harlot, see, God wouldn't judge. He wouldn't judge until the fullness of the Gentiles be, be come in. The full, their iniquity be full. In other words, there was going to be many other, many other brothers, many others that's going to die. They're going to be persecuted. 
They're going to either literally die or their influence is going to be killed. Many, even the reformers, many of them were, were killed. We have taught that in, uh, when the church is restored down here, it wouldn't have been easy to see several years back, but now it's pretty easy to see that a, a righteous man that won't join up with this world system, it, there, there's going to be men that winds up in jail for preaching the truth. And it's going to separate the men from the boys before this is over with. The apostle Paul was beaten. Uh, those 12 apostles were killed. Uh, uh, and so uh, there'll be many that will suffer death down here, uh, but God will avenge it when he judges the whole system. And if he, if he would have just judged it back there, it would have started all over again because it hadn't come to its fullness and God didn't have a restored church to judge it with. And so here, after God judges this harlot system, he says, he had judged the great harlot, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. He finally brought vengeance that that, that condition in the fifth seal was crying out for judgment. When are you going to judge this? There's a condition here that needs to be judged. He said, I know it, but I can't judge it until there will be a time that it has to pass by and the iniquity of this system of man is going to have to be finished. My mercy will, will, uh, will be long suffering. I'll be patient for a long time trying to save everyone that I can save, but eventually I will bring eternal judgment. I'll bring a full manifestation in my coming, my second coming. I'll come again and Jesus will come again exactly the way that he came back there. He came on the day of Pentecost. He did not come and gather up a people or rapture them. He did not do that. He came back um, through, the, through the Spirit of God. He came back through the Holy Ghost, came back into people's lives, came back in a ministry. That ministry imparted the sevenfold light, the full unadulterated, unadulterated truth of God's unleavened bread. That's bread or the word of God without any falsehood in it. God will finally have the church restored and judgment will come on this earth and God will finally have this, this world in a condition that he can gather his righteous out of it and judge those that will not heed See, once God shows, once God shows all that he has in a full manifestation, both of the spirit, the demonstration of the spirit, healings, miracles. See, God's not a God that just wants to go around just, you know, slinging his power and his wonders around doing miracles. And now that is not how God works. God uses miracles and healings to manifest himself and to draw people to him, to show to people that he is uh, uh, that he is a, a, a alive and well, and that he is a powerful God. But he, he does it mainly to gather people together, plus for his mercy's sake, people do have needs and God wants to help people in their needs. Uh, and so, but God's not just, you know, I've said many times a cosmic Santa Claus, so to speak, where he just goes around answering everybody's whim and everybody's care. God has purpose in everything that he does. And uh, sometimes we don't understand it, but God does have purpose in it and wisdom in his purpose. Um, so let's read on down because I'm getting I'm getting down to answer these questions. Uh, and again, he said, "Hallelujah!" Verse three, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Smoke is after a fire, fire's judgment. And here in this book of Revelation and prophecy, fire and brimstone is always judgment. 
Smoke follows that. Smoke's the aftermath of a fire. It rolls up forever and ever. You'll, those of us that live throughout eternity will never forget, will never forget what God did to finally bring the world to a complete judgment, those of righteousness that he gathered into life eternal and those that were unrighteous into uh, eternal death. The gift, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal. Verse four, and the four and 20 elders and four beasts fell down and worshiped God and um, sat on the, uh, worship God that sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah, and a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters and the voice of mighty thundering saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife have made herself ready. Okay, the question was, when is the bride going to be made up and who's going to be there? Verse eight says, and to her was given, oh, it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Uh, the bride, she's she's made herself ready. Uh, you know, somebody, you know, every young girl when she gets married, she wants to look perfect for her wedding. And of course, many people probably don't know why that the church has always advocated that she be married in a white wedding gown because that is biblical for righteousness. That's also why a girl is to be a virgin. When she gets married, she is the only in that white gown represented that. It represents that she's kept herself for her, her wedding day for her husband. Uh, that's a picture. We are keeping ourselves unto the Lord only and righteous and and not being involved with any other system or any other man-made system, any other man than Jesus Christ. We have tried to grow and develop and get to a place that we're ready to give ourselves fully and wholly to the Lord Jesus Christ in righteousness. That's what that fine linen is a picture of the righteousness of the saints. Verse nine says, and he said unto me, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith unto me, these are true sayings of God. And I fell at the feet to, him, to worship him. And he said to me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This man, this angel that was telling John uh, these things, when John saw these things, he fell at the feet uh, to worship him, this angel. And he said to me, don't you do that. I am your fellow servant and of thy brethren, he, he states uh, later that I'm of thy brethren, the prophets. Uh, and I have the testimony of Jesus. Don't worship me, but worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And he said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, the right and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Okay, see, the this, uh, the, the bride has come. She's made herself ready. The bride, uh, okay. Now his eyes were as flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture 
dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Well, that seems a little bit strange that in one statement he's saying he has a name no one knew but he himself, but his name is the word of God. Let me explain that to you just a little bit. A name, your name is your character. Nobody really knows you but you other than God. But you, you could say, my wife has said this at different times. Uh, she said, uh, you don't even know your own spouse sometimes. You think you know them, but sometimes they'll throw you a curve. You, you, you'll you find something out about them that you really didn't realize. A name is a character. No one, I've said this many times, you, your testimony is your testimony. Nobody knows everything in your mind, but you and God. You know who you are. You know what you're made up of. I know Jeremiah said, uh, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I'll tell you who can know it is a, is a child of God that's righteous that God begins to Peel the peeling off of the onion, I'll say. You know, there's many layers. God has to help us to see ourselves and to know ourselves. And um, so uh, no one, no one had the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was the word of God. And no one knew that fully, save he. And so... Uh, in the same way, in, in uh, one of the letters to the seven churches, it says, he that overcometh will I give a little stone, a little white stone, and in that stone a new name, and no man will know that name except he that receives it. It just means when God finishes his work in you, no one will understand what you've been through, but you, no one will have the exact same righteous character that you have because you will be individual just like a fingerprint. You're just going to be one of many of God's many members in the, in the kingdom of heaven. All right, verse 14 says, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Here, Jesus is on a white horse. See, that white horse that went from white to red to black to pale, it comes back. Actually, we've always taught that in the Reformation, when God started reforming the church, Martin Luther, which produced the Protestant movement, the church went from the pale horse back to a black horse, started going back the other way. We're headed back into what the early church had, and we'll go back in we're going back in the back door. We're going back in exactly the way they came out. And so uh, the Protestant movement was a black horse type era. Then the church, then when Pentecost, when God finally uh, poured out the Holy Ghost in America in 1901 and established it through Azusa Street in Los Angeles, and it came back across America and was established by 1903, uh, that was uh, the Pentecostal movement. The red horse was established. We have been in the red horse now. Uh, I'll say we were in the red horse up until 2003, 100 years. Now I think we're in a garment change phase. I think God has uh, put us in the day of the Lord. 30-year period, it's a 30-year period and a 15-year period, and I think we're in that 30-year period. Um, and the church, the church will go into the last prophetical hour. My time frame on it's in 2033. And so we're, we're already, you know, if I'm right about that, and I'm not trying to be emphatic about an actual year, but that's where I'm at. That's how I see it in prophecy. And I, I don't have time to go through all that right now, but I have before. Uh, if we're in 2021, we've got 12 years before the church is going to be restored. 
again, I'm not emphatic about that. I'm not one of these guys that like to pre predict a certain year, you know, uh, because I've seen men do that and it not happen. But we do know we're somewhere down in the end of the Gentile world. So um, we ought to really be working to be children of the day and watch and pray. Jesus said, watch and pray. I think we are down in the, the, the final watch. Anyway, and he was clothed with vesture blood. Okay, the armies that were with him were in heaven, followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. These horses is these these army, this army that's with him is right now, I'm putting it as the bride of Christ that's with Christ that will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Let's read verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is King of many kings. He's going to make us kings and priests uh, to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. He is the Lord of Lords, the, that bride group. We don't know how many will be in that group. Uh, I know that uh, 144,000 are mentioned, but I certainly believe that is a not a literal number, but a symbolic number. It's a symbolic number of government. Uh, there was uh, there was in the Second Chronicles, the twenty second twenty seventh chapter. If you read that chapter, there were twenty four thousand per month that served in David's administration in the, in in Judah under David's rule. 24,000 times 12 months every month. They, a new 24,000 group went in. That is 288,000. And I say there's 144,000 in the early church government of the bride that's made up, and there's another 144,000 made up in the restored church in the gen, among the Gentiles. That's 288,000. And I put them... Uh, the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. There's 144,000, 12,000 in each tribe, and there is no tribe at that time. Uh, God's not restoring the tribe when he restores Israel. He's probably going to just restore a remnant, but they will be grafted back in. That's a type of Elisha uh, receiving the mantle of Elijah. We're still a part of the Elijah ministry and Elisha uh, will receive our mantle, and it will be the ministry, a Jewish ministry, that will carry the gospel down through the thousand years with the, the bride of Christ ruling and reigning with him. Think about it. Brother, who was it? Brother Rader, he's passed away now, was pastor in Louisville, Kentucky under... Brother James Souders' church, and which was Brother William Souders' church there. And uh, he used the scripture in Daniel where Daniel showed there would be a thousand, thousand, and ten thousand times ten thousand. He said there should be around a hundred million in the bride. Well, uh, think about it for a minute. The bride is going to it's a, going to be a great number of bride members. And if they're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, and there has been 6,000 years has already transpired since the fall of Adam. And, and in this 6,000 year period, we've made up the bride. We haven't even touched the new earth. They, you know, uh, Abraham, God's promise to Abraham would, was that the stars of heaven 
uh, the, his children would be as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea. We've always taught the stars of heaven as the bride members. You ever went outside and looked up at the stars at night when there's a, a bright uh, starlit night? You see thousands, maybe millions of stars, but it can't even compare to the sand in the sea. God, uh, in this this 6,000 year world, there's been many, many people produced of God's people and uh, then down through the thousand years. But look at this, only the bride is gonna be perfected and reach a place to have eternal life in the end of the Jewish world. Part of them were made up in the end of the Gen Jewish world, part of them were made up in the end of the Gentile world. They'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years, but we have only cleaned up the Jews and those in the Gentile world that God was dealing with, predominantly, God chose America to restore his church in. He came from the East, the Eastern world, Europe, Britain, Germany, all of those nations back there uh, come up through Rome and uh, France, uh, God working through all of that to finally send those that he sent to the United States of America uh, to establish a land that he preserved to restore his church in. That's where he's done this work. That's where the gospel, the work of the gospel, has been carried out of the United States of America to all of these other nations now. And uh, God chose this nation, not because we're better people, not because we're smarter, not because of any other reason because of us, but because of him, that he, he had to choose a place just like he chose Jerusalem, uh, Israel in the Jewish world. He chose America in the Gentile world. And God's reaching out to America. He'll restore his church right here. I think the Jews will be grafted in right here. No question that Jerusalem or Israel will be affected greatly, which, by the way, we do need to pray for them. They're under great attack today in this world, and they do need our prayers. But they are, they still are an antichrist people. They still don't accept Christ as the Messiah but they are God's chosen for his elect's sake and he will graft them back in. And so there's a reason for that. Um, I'll go into explaining that later. But anyway, so these uh, are gonna uh, tread down the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of God down through the thousand years. Remember, he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And I saw an angel stand, I'm reading verse 17, in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to the, all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and flesh of captains and flesh of mighty men and flesh of horses and them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Well, uh, uh, this is talking about the God bringing eternal judgment. Did you know that the day of the Lord's also called the day of wrath? It's the day of God's wrath. It's the day of vengeance. Uh, let me read to you the 110th Psalm, uh, verse five. Uh, number one, he said, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here he's making a promise to Christ that he's gonna be a priest forever, not just for a generation or for a period of time, but he's gonna be a high priest 
like Melchizedek, not having mother or father, not having a time to begin or end. And verse five, it says, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He'll judge among the heathen. He'll fill the places with the dead bodies. He'll wound the heads over many countries. He'll drink the wine of the brook in the way. Therefore, he shall lift up his head. See, God's gonna judge this world. And when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place, God is going to have brought great judgment in this world that's going to judge the Gentile world. That will make up the bride of Jesus Christ. And so there'll be a great happening take place there. Then in verse 19, said, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet. See, it looks like that the bride's going to be made up and even have a part of the final judgment in the end of the Gentile world. See, the bride was made up. Uh, AD 70 uh, was poured out. Uh, after that, here, the bride's going to be made up after God judges Babylon, after he ju judges the beast system. It says, and the beast, I'm reading verse 20, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. See, this has to be in the end of the Gentile world the Gentile church before Armageddon. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And we're told that the lake of fire burning with brimstone uh, is second death. God will destroy the beast and the false prophet when he destroys that system. And the remnant were slain. Uh, one of the Later, Vial says that that's going to make way. The drying up of Euphrates is going to make way for the kings of the east, the 10 kings that will come into power. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, and with the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with all their flesh. So uh, there's going to be a great judgment, saints of God, that's going to take place. Uh, so I'm running out of time here. I would go into the, uh, I, I will go, if you'll just go with me quickly and we'll close with this in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelations. Most of you know that it's talking about the, that, the uh, Satan, that old serpent, which is called Satan and the devil, is cast is is bound for a thousand years. See, the devil is bound, but he's not he's not destroyed like the beast and the false prophet were. He can't be yet, because the devil represents the wicked, and and even though God may clean up the whole world in a thousand years, then there's going to be a resurrection of the unjust after the thousand years, and and that's when Satan is loosed for a little season. See, wickedness will be loosed in man, because every man dying unjust is going to resurrect that way, and wickedness is still going to be in him, and God's got to judge that. And so there'll be a great white throne. God will judge everything out of the sea. All of his people that went into the world, went back into the world for whatever reason. Some starved to death, some were victims, some rebelled. There's many reasons. Some of God's people went back into the world, but they're still God's people and they're still going to have an opportunity because they're his people. God will not give the, he will not eternally judge them without giving them an opportunity. Uh, they're going to see in the last prophetical hour, a full manifestation of God. They'll be able to come out of the world just like Babylon saints are gonna be able to come out of Babylon and God will call them out of the world and if they don't heed that call, they will be judged eternally unworthy of life. But they'll have an opportunity. And, 
And those that died and didn't get in that judgment in the restored church will come up after the thousand years so that they can see the same thing, the, the full unadulterated uh, manifestation of God, both spirit and the word of God, and they'll be judged by that. If they'll heed to it, they'll be saved eternally. And if they don't, they'll be destroyed. Okay, and here in verse 10, it says, and the devil that deceived them, this is, uh, will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So God is going to destroy evil eventually, but he can't destroy it until all, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Uh, and death where uh, sin is, sin uh, produces death. The, the wages of sin is death. And so uh, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when uh, sin is finished, it brings forth death. Where there's no sin, there's no there's no law. Uh, so uh, God can't judge the devil. He can't judge evil, not until he finally judges the evil that's in every man that's on the earth. And so the bride has a big, big job to work, rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. I said earlier, there's in 1,000 years, we're gonna clean up the whole world we're only two small groups of people in the world were able to be judged in the two thousand in the six thousand years prior. Four thousand years it took to bring that kind of judgment in Israel, and another two thousand to bring it in the Gentile world. And so in one thousand years, with the help of the bride of Christ, what if there is a million in the bride? What if those people do? work with Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Kings and Priests, that uh, remember what Jesus said? He said, you've been faithful over 10 cities. You've been faithful over little. I'll make you ruler over 10 cities because they took a pound and made 10 pounds out of it. He, he, another one took a pound, made five pounds out of it, said, I'm going to make you rule over five cities. But Leninger used to tell us that We'd be rulers over cities, over the whole world. God would send us into, and we would have the power and the operation of Jesus Christ as our authority and the wisdom of God through perfection that he perfects us in to do the work that he will have called us to do in ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. My Lord, saints of God, don't you want to, see the operation of God and see all of this transpire and watch. Finally, it comes down to the end. I'm going to read you just a little bit here in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, where it said, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is a river of life. Talking about the Spirit of God that's flowing, a pure river in throughout eternity. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there a tree of life, both sides of the river. The tree of life that was manifested in the early church and the tree of life that was manifested in the restored church of the Gentile world, which bare 12 manners of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there was no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, no need, uh, uh, they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light. They shall reign forever and ever. Let me uh, say this about the 12 manners of fruits. 
you know, Brother Linegar caught that, that there's only nine fruits mentioned in, in Galatians, in, in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. Uh, you know, he mentions uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Uh, I I uh, I know Brother Leninger, he, he worked on it too. Uh, so far, the best I could be able to come up with, if you remember in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Well, he got, Paul mentioned faith and charity or love, the agape love of God in uh, Galatians 5, but he didn't mention hope. So I'll say hope. That's number 10. Then uh, Peter, in 2 Peter, he said that we were to add to godliness brotherly kindness. And so that's filial love. Uh, he mentioned kindness, but it's a different word altogether than filial love. I believe that brotherly kindness is the step right before charity. It's the step right before a restored church. And then in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, Paul said, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to continue to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. See what's in the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, Jesus said, giving thanks to his name. I think that the fruit of praise, of recognizing your God, see, that has to be one of the fruits. Uh, anyway, there's 12 fruits. I gave you three more there to make up the 12. And uh, anyway, then it says, and he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly be done. I want to address that shortly real quick here. This word shortly is explained in Revelations 1 and 1. Jesus was sent an angel to show John the things that was must shortly come to pass. And the time was at hand. What he's saying there is, is that what needs to take shortly, what needs to happen shortly is AD 70's coming, the destruction of Jerusalem the end of the Gentile time. And then I'm also going to show you the future of the Gentiles. It's time. It is time for that to be written and given so that it will be preserved. It shortly must be done. We don't have much time to get all this accomplished. When John went off the scene, there no one be able to give the book of Revelation or the future to us. And so shortly, AD 70 was going to take place. Then in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, after the letters to the seven churches, preparing them uh, for who could still make the bride. In the fourth chapter, uh, John heard a voice. He heard a trumpet, a sound of a trumpet. And that said, come up hither and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. That had to take place shortly after Jesus gave the revelation to John, the beginning of having a knowledge of the future had to take place. And so uh, he just going back over this and showing that uh, if you don't keep the sayings of the book, he's going right back and saying that, you know, if you're filthy, you're going to be filthy still. If you're unjust, you'll be unjust still. He just ending his talk about this in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Anyway, I hope you got something out of what I said tonight. Uh, the bride will be made up after God judges Babylon. He'll make the make his bride up. There will be great judgment in the last, that last prophetical hour. He'll judge the beast and the false prophet. And then the bride will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. A lot of work to be done. And... Uh, He'll finish that judgment after the thousand years of the resurrection of the unjust. God bless your hearts. Uh, I love all of you, God's people. 
Uh, I, we'll get off of this book of Revelation before too long, but hey, it, we're living in a time that it needs to be gone over. It needs to be revealed. You need to hear somebody that can give you a reasonable answer of what this book is saying. Pay attention to it. Get it. Write it down. I'm saving. Uh, you can go to our website. You can click on a link. It's on our Facebook page. All of these messages are being taped uh, for your playing over and over again. And they're also in chronological order on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is FGCLR. That stands for First Gospel Church, Little Rock Media, M-E-D-I-A, FGCLR Media. That is our Facebook channel. If you go there, click on subscribe, hit the bell, and you will, every time I get on, every time that one of these messages comes up on there, you'll be notified as a subscriber. And uh, you'll be off as well. If you'll follow our Facebook page, you'll be notified every time I go live with a Bible study. All right. Let's see here before we go home. Uh, looks like several of our people are on here from this week. Brother Elias C. Priam, Dos Mujeres Moliendo y Uno Molino, Una Sara Tomara y la Otra Tejada. So Brother Elias is on here and, and uh, his people, some of his people. Uh, Brother David Paul, God bless your heart, Brother David Paul. It's good to hear you. Um, brother, da brother Elias gave Daniel 7 and 10, another verse I gave on the uh, bride, Sister Doran from Kentucky. It's good to see her on here with us, Brother Pierre, Julien, Sister Betty Layton. That's my saint in Texas. God bless your heart, Sister Layton. Uh, brother Fidel, that's in... Uh, um, Brother Fidel, that's in, um, I've got the, uh, Brother Fidel, he's in Guatemala. He's in Guatemala City, Guatemala. That's where he's from. He's, uh, he was in Brother Dave's assembly many years and, and wound up back in Guatemala, his home country. He, uh, he shares with us on many of our Bible studies. And so Sister Pauline McNabb's watching, Sister Bussy, uh, God bless your hearts, all of you. It's just good to have everybody. Brother Clyde Quick from Missouri is listening. Uh, and so we appreciate all of you so much and uh, your hunger and your love for the word of God. God bless your hearts. Uh, pray for me. And I'll pray for you. God bless your hearts. Amen.